Hey guys, how you doing? You out there on the road? Hey, hey. Al, well, we are on the road. <laughs> so a we, good time. we usually we have, have two a, kids in okay. one screen, so it might be a little awkward, but uh, um, you know, we haven't had Matt on a lot, but Matt is uh, a lot. At all. At all. So we're, we're well, he was on the he was on the webinar yeah, uh, version yeah. of you, Tuesday you spend a lot of time on our on our on our Zoom calls. But but Matt is director of sales and probably is the most connected and has sold the most parts in our industry, I, I think. I mean, I think it'll be hard to find somebody else who's who's designed and, and, and built as many parts over the last six years yeah. as Matt has. So um, the talk we're having today really um, he will bring a lot of, of um, history and, and um and knowledge about what it's like in the industry today and some of the topics that we want to talk about around um, used equipment. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So uh, we have, we have a lot to talk about, but I want to just kind of catch up with you guys first, if that's okay. You guys have been out on the road as we've talked about everybody's seen your videos. I even tried to mimic one of your videos, um, but uh, you guys have been to many a park. Now, where are you today? So right now, right now we're in uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, about to measure a, a brand new park. So we're going into this building, it's a completely blank slate. We're excited to see some of our clients still building parks, but this journey has kind of been fun to take because we started down in Greenville, South Carolina, went up through Asheville, hit that market. And then one of my favorite stops was Sevierville, Tennessee, where we got to see Top Jump and severe air both parks were doing booming business which yeah, was really well really encouraging talking to the owners hearing about their numbers so far it was really great to see kids out jumping parents um, letting their kids come out and jump it, it was really great to see from there we went uh to elizabethtown kentucky next yeah uh, maybe you can finish yeah saw, saw sky's the limit um with tim thomas and his team and his family that have, have just put together such a, a wonderful looking trampoline park and um, you know business is coming back I mean they're starting to do things and see things where uh, customers are getting more confident to return and uh, just a genuinely great guy got to see Fort Knox yeah <laughs> so we drove by <laughs> we waved at all the gold um, so that was a cool. very far distance <laughs> very far distance right? uh, we were not pretty but uh, you know one of the things that we talk about a lot on these these town halls and podcasts is just the relational side of our business and you know we get to serve some of the most awesome people and I haven't been out on the road nearly as much as Matt has and Matt's built built these relationships over the years and so just to to spend time and break bread and and hear the stories um, so many good stories about what our our families and owners that are are doing these parks have gone through to get to where they are has just been been great so sky's the limit in um E-Town, e -town, right? Yeah. And then uh, we went to Clarksville, Indiana, across the border. <laughs> and um, uh, didn't know we were going to go to Indiana, but we were in Indiana and <laughs> saw check that one off your list. Extremnasium. <laughs> and, and, you know, they have done just such a great job with their branding and marketing. And, and you know, they started with this, this idea, you know, of, of building a brand around a character. And it's, it's, they've just done so well. Yeah. And what do you call it? Like he found his Mickey Mouse. Yeah. First. He was looking for his Mickey Mouse. Yeah. And it's a ninja character that is just throughout the, throughout the park. And so it's a ninja and adventure park. So, um, so they're, they're doing well. And, and what, what I've been encouraged by is, is everyone is they're, they're tentative about what the future is, but they're hopeful right. and they're willing to invest in and at least investigate what things that they could do um, in Q4 and Q1 next year that will help them kind of rebound, yeah. no pun intended. <laughs> so yeah so we uh from there we went up to uh lexington kentucky and then uh, up to columbus we just saw um a park in mansfield ohio an altitude park uh, mm -hmm. that owner has two parks so we'll see his second park the fun spot built in um heath ohio and then like matt said the uh, the park that we're going to be uh measuring and getting feedback for so we uh can produce here too sweet so, it, I mean, it is great to hear that, you know, people are starting new business and things like that. People are uh, having that same excitement that they, they had uh, for us before all of this happened and for the industry and everything. People are out, out at the parks. But we have noticed that COVID did get the best of some parks. And it's just like every other business that, uh, you know, this is something that was – 
unfortunately, it was just kind of inescapable. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And it's something we want to make sure that we talk about without um, putting terror in anybody's eyes or heart. Uh, but we want to also make sure uh, as this is um, this whole entire podcast is deemed, uh, we want to make sure that everybody has all the information before they make any kind of business venture whatsoever uh, in the adventure park arena. So today we're going to talk about buying used equipment, a used park. Um, it sounds too good to be true. So, you know, the saying, um, so you guys just kind of tell me I'm, I'm a marketing guy. I understand the industry and whatnot, but I have also not done what you guys do. So explain to me why it is or isn't a good investment or a good idea to buy used equipment or a used park. Yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a great question, and it, it comes on the heels of uh, a number of phone calls we've had over, I'll say, the past three to four weeks, where parks that are not going to reopen. Um, are finding themselves on different auction sites um, or just for sale by owner. Um, and then, so we have that side of the equation that we're hearing about. And then the other side is, is people who are, are going to attempt to take advantage of, of that situation and, and, and buy right. low and, right. and, and think that they're going to come out ahead. And so some of the things Matt and I have talked about over the past couple of weeks is, is this, you know, there are times where it does make sense, but from what we've experienced, it seems like there's a lot of things that people who are picking up equipment for pennies on the dollar aren't considering. And uh, we just want to make sure they consider that and, and really just put ourselves in a position to uh, answer questions, be available. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people have questions and they're considering buying used equipment, we'd be happy to, to have a phone call with anyone um, that has that interest. But um, so, some of the first things that, that we thought about is, you know, if, if, a, if a park is for sale, um, there's a couple of reasons uh, or, or a couple of situations where that falls into. One is it's available in its, in its, in its existing space. Right. And so maybe, maybe you pay a, 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 an amount for that, that park and then you take over the lease and you run it. You, you would continue to operate continue it in to, that space. Yeah. Right. That's, that's the best case scenario. I think when, yeah. we, when we've seen those opportunities um, that makes the most sense. A lot of what we want to talk about today has to do with people who think they can, buy it, uninstall it, and then reinstall it somewhere else. Yeah, operating it in the same space might indicate also you can renegotiate a lease, work with the landlord, come yeah. up with a different structure there. So that would be the best case scenario. But many of the ones that we've been getting phone calls about have been a situation where either the, the equipment is up for auction and they have to uninstall it, reinstall it. And there are just some pitfalls there, I'd, I'd say, that I think everybody needs to be aware of. Yeah. Um, mostly to do with, you know, potentially figuring out what you're buying first. So my experience lends itself to have seen the industry grow from what we would consider a generation one park mm -hmm. and all the way to what I kind of consider maybe a, maybe even a gen six park. Yes. This is where we're over the past six years, I'd say every year enough innovation has happened to our industry to really be approaching this generation six with new attractions like soft play, virtual reality, zip lines, um, ninja courses, ropes courses, climbing walls. So I think step one is to really figure out what it is you're buying. What, right? Exactly. What, what are you buying? And, and I think there's more Gen 1, 2 parks for sale than there are Gen 5, 6 because they just opened up and they're probably more better positioned to, to kind of ride this out. But, you know, the Gen 1, Gen 2 parks, they've, they've likely made their money and they're ready to just, you know, kind of walk away. And, and But the, the person who's looking to make that deal needs to not only add in the cost of that equipment that they're buying on auction, but the uninstall. I mean, an, an uninstall is not as easy as it seems. I mean, right. it is steel and concrete, but um, you know how you package that together, how you palletize it, um, so that it can be reinstalled. Um, you know, we've talked with customers who are already uninstalled, and they're trying to get us to come reinstall it. Well, it's going to cost them more because we didn't do the uninstall, right? And we um, don't know what condition they uninstalled it in. We don't yeah. know where it's palletized, how it's palletized, um, what, what extra time it's going to take because they spent uh, time with a general contractor yep. to uninstall that and uh, put it in a potential warehouse. Yeah. And so we, we are able to uninstall a park, whether we built it or not. Um, but I think you do want to consider having a, a manufacturer um, come in and, and take care of that um, so that they can honestly, it just saves you money on the backside for the reinstall. But then there is the reinstall cost. 
Right. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, you guys know this because you design parks all the time. Uh, Matt, as Scott had said, you've probably done it more than anybody in this industry and all over the world. So you know that the footprint of a park is very um, particular. It's indigenous to the pieces that you originally chose. So taking those pieces out, uh, yeah, we can re we can upgrade your park with say a wipeout here and there, but we can't take a whole park and just shove it into another. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Oh yeah. I, I mean, oftentimes when you're starting out the process to design a brand new park, you're taking into consider ceiling heights, um, column spacing, where those columns are located in the building. We're doing our best job when we build a park for the first time to really maximize the space. So but unless you found a, the, the perfect building with these same exact dimensions, there's really a likely a strong likelihood what you buy may not even all of it fit into yeah, the new space. Yeah, a, a good good percentage of that park that you purchase use um, it likely won't. I mean, if you have a main court that has a, a column pad in the middle uh, from its original space, well, the likelihood of that same column being in that same spot in that main court is virtually none. Right. And so all of a sudden you've got retrofitting and upgrading that you need to do to, to fill that hole. And then you've got to, you know, take out some other trampolines where the new column hits the, the, the main court really. And that, that's cost. Well, and the other thing is, do you really want to reinstall all of that Gen 1 equipment? You know, right. does that make sense depending on where you're putting this new park? Does it make sense to put the three dodgeball courts that you bought on auction back into a new space, expecting that to be the park you want it to be to compete with what's potentially out there already that's newer? Yeah, you, yeah. Should, you definitely don't want to put that next door to a Gen 5 or 6 park. Right. So, right. Yeah, because right. you will total. And the thing is, is that let's say that somebody bought an old fun spot park. Let's just say that that's the case. Let's just throw this up for devil's advocate reasons. Let's say that they bought that and moved it from Missouri to Louisiana or whatever the case is. Sure. So, and they put it next to a gen five or six park or even a gen four park. And it's a gen one or gen two. Then they're ultimately going to be mad at fun spot for not having uh, you know, giving them what we're doing today, like con you know, the consultation or, or whatever. It's, it's what, we're, what we're saying is in, in those cases, the, the, there is a, a cost benefit analysis that would, could say that you're better off building new. I mean, mm -hmm. we're here to do whatever the customer wants, yeah. but in order to compete um, and the, the amount of equipment that can be used from a, a used park compared to what you would want to use and upgrade anyways. Right the price savings and cost savings of, of building all new um, and competing at a higher level is, is certainly worth considering. Well, and, but also the cost analysis into building a new part versus reusing another one isn't just limited to what new attractions you might have to put in there, but also you've got to consider what condition the used equipment is in. Mm. So, you know, the questions that I ask myself when I'm brought a, a potential project that is, needs to be moved could be, new new mats new trampoline mats what condition are the trampoline mats in, are in are, are you wanting to keep those the same color are yeah. you going to want to rebrand those to fit maybe an existing brand that they already operate or if they're a new operator maybe they're okay with keeping that colors but mm -hmm. you also have the same decisions to be made for all the padding mm -hmm. which really the padding is one of the most significant costs all the foam and the vinyl is one of the most significant costs within the trampoline park so that needs to be considered springs well, you got yeah. all your branding on the padding and, yeah, and, and yeah. no okay. graphics. Yeah. Our fit and finish on a standard trampoline park would you'd expect to see a lot of logos and branding and theming that you won't be able to keep anymore that you'll want to refresh anyways with your own, especially if an existing brand is buying it to reopen as an, a, another park. Yeah. So that's the, all the factors, including the uninstall and reinstall costs. Um, and really the other biggest ticket item that I can think of is no one's talking about the elevated platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are as good as scrap when Pretty it comes much. out of the old building because of how you're going to have to reconfigure the new trampoline park, add new attractions. If you're raising the floor up and you're going to have to build those platforms to interconnect all the trampolines, you need those, you need new stairs, a wheelchair ramp, all the railings, everything to complement it. So that all of those combined put into a cost analysis really makes it difficult 
to make it a saving, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, 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 I mean, we've done a couple of them and it's, it's come out, you know, where, you know, someone's picking up, you know, what may five years ago been $500,000 worth of equipment for 40 or $50,000. But when we've gone back and added in these numbers of things that are a real cost that have to be done to move that equipment, it, it's approaching that $500,000 or, or, or more in cases because of the savings that we have in, in building parks you know, today compared to what we were, were building them four or five years ago. So I'm not, we're not saying it's, it's 100% of the time, but it's definitely, you know, our, our purpose is just to educate people to ask the right questions yeah. before, they, before they drop that 50 grand, 60 grand on, on used equipment and then start asking the questions. Yeah, and, and you know, our, our uh, coworker, uh, Nate, is always out there evangelizing safety like we all are, but his whole thing is about maintenance and safety and everything. And to your point, Matt, is that the maintenance just might not have been there. You know, you don't really, it's, it's kind of like, um, there's not a car fax for a park, you know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, so, um, we, we, there's no way for us to go in and be like, oh yeah, you got about 30 more miles on, you know, this, that, and that. Now we can do that for springs and things like that. Um, and to a certain extent, everything else, but I mean, not really. I mean, you can't tell them like, you're going to get three more years out of this park. You're you know? right. One of my favorite questions, yet hardest questions mm -hmm. to answer when someone's buying a brand new park who may be new to this industry is, hey, how often am I going to have to replace my springs and, and trampolines? And I, I, I always say to them, hopefully as soon as possible, because that means your business yeah. is booming, right? <laughs> you know, so hopefully quickly. Yeah. But the reality is, is I couldn't, I mean, we've, we've been in eight trampoline parks mm -hmm. this, this trip, and I couldn't look at one or the other and say, yeah, that one has three more months left on it. That one has yeah. two more years left on it. Um, a lot of things you replace because aesthetically it doesn't look good. And then to your point, many considerations are made for safety reasons. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you are interested in really vetting a project, you really need to get the manufacturer, you know, like us, who's AS team certified and part of the IATP to really look at it and evaluate it, especially if it's our equipment, that would be the best um, evaluation mm -hmm. um, source resource that you could use to see if what you're buying is worth it. What kind of modifications to help you do that cost analysis. Yeah. And, and as it stands right now, we're happy to come out and meet people and, and look at equipment. Um, yeah, you know, as a consultation. So if, if people are in that, in that boat where they're considering it, you know, give us a call, you know, we'll, we'll hop in a car or get a plane. Yeah. We're, we're on a long five day road trip right now. So we're clearly okay with traveling. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Another thing to consider, uh, Al, as, as you know, someone's looking at a, at a park is you know, the standards from ASTM from 2012 um, have only increased and 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 really gotten better and made trampoline parks more safe in yeah 2020 so someone who moves a 2015 16 17 even park um, is going to have to make sure that it meets the new 2020 standards which is going to have a cost to it um, and that could cost a pretty penny just getting it up to code so to speak i mean yeah yeah um i mean i yeah i hear you guys evangelizing that all the time you know i echo your words in, in the marketing side of things. But of course I, I see all that evangelized and I see people talking about that. And, and in the early stages of Tuesday town hall, even, uh, you know, we just heard different States have different, uh, you know, I guess laws and regulations and things like that. So you could really fall into a, a, a money pit, so to speak. You're right. And that, that wouldn't necessarily be pushed by us. Oftentimes, uh, when you go to get insurance, right. the first question they're going to ask is who built it? Is it ASTM compliant? And, you know, if you're new to this industry, you just may not know. Yeah. Um, another reason why it's going to be important to get us involved to really look at the equipment, maybe even do the install to certify it from us to make sure it is ASTM compliant. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is get Chuck in a truck. Right. No offense to Chuck. <laughs> um, to to bolt down this deal into concrete and yeah. then start letting kids jump on it. Um, there are requirements, regulations, uh, state, local, and, and, yeah. and higher that, that are, need to be met. And so, and it's for the safety of the public. You know, we, we, we are a, a safety first uh, company and industry and want to lead the way there. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you, you can go and do this as much as you want to and things like that, but, you also have to worry about the the engineering drawings and things like that because they're stamped, aren't they? Like previously from the previous time that they're 
So being on the design, heavily on the design side, we're seeing that almost in every single project going forward. And with just the little time frame that we've experienced getting a few projects that have either been, been on, bought on auction or uh, built by either both domestic or offshore manufacturers, they, the people interested in buying or may have already bought this equipment, not entirely knowing what they bought, can't get the draw, get accurate drawings, which is only going to make it even more difficult to move forward, to install this, get it certified, get an engineer. I mean, could you imagine trying to re redo drawings for mm-hmm. a park that's already built? You're bought on auction. You're new to this industry, trying to install it, trying to do it on your own as cheap yeah. as possible. I mean, you're right. Money pit. I don't, May not be. <laughs> could be worse than <laughs> yeah, that. Could be worse than that. I don't know what's worse than that, but yeah. um, money yeah. meteor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Money meteor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's <laughs> let's let's not get too too down in the weeds. But man, yeah, it, yeah. it's uh, it's really that scary because, I mean, we like we were talking about our main goal in everything we do is safety everything we do is safety is first. It's even up in the factory, everything like that. It's, it's number one across the board. And if Nate were here, he would say it even louder than the rest of us, but it's hard for us to go out. And now I've, I've heard Nate say this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I heard Nate say this, if I heard this incorrectly, maybe Nate didn't say it this way, but we can only, set guidelines and have uh, all of our uh, manuals and things like that for parks that we originally are pieces that we originally built and those manuals even though we built it may even be updated so much because of the generations so therefore that's twofold if we're if if say we're moving the park for you or something like that you know what I mean because we, we provide that service, correct? Yes. Okay. So, so if we're doing that and our manuals and the AST, which our manuals are based on ASTM, so that would right there rival everything, but it has to be from the actual manufacturer, the original manufacturer of the park, correct? Yeah. We'd, we'd want to work if, if, if there's a park, whether it was built by another domestic competitor or an offshore competitor. um, Yeah. We would have to work with that person original, Mm -hmm. To, to make it up to standards. Um, otherwise we had, would have a very difficult time, you know, putting our stamp on it cause we didn't build the steel. We didn't, we didn't, yeah. we don't know the quality of some of the, that equipment. So yeah, a, a non fun spot park from our standpoint is the most challenging for us. Um, but I still think we can consult on that. Yeah, absolutely. And off the time our manuals are bespoke for each park. Yeah. So it's possible to do that for even a park that isn't built by us to update and, be specifically for even somebody else's equipment Mm -hmm. where they meet those standards as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, I mean, what if, what if, um, let's say again, devil's advocate here, what, uh, what happens if say the original manufacturer is now defunct and you know, you want to, you want us to come in and take care of that for you. Um, how, how much more of a, I guess, red tape, is that? Um, I mean, no, what's I, our first? Uh, like our, our first questions for some of those that we've had calls yeah. are: is like, how do we get our eyes on this equipment? Yeah, yeah. First off, let's do a we, cyber. We want to be able to, to yeah, check yeah. it out, see it, put our eyes on it, and then I think we can make a, a, a recommendation as to whether um, we would even be willing um, to put our name on it. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. So there, there is some equipment out there that just isn't going to be. Um, eligible for fun spot to say, yeah, we would help out with that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's that bad. Uh, there, there's others that's, that's fine that yeah. would, you know, we would, um, we could look at the steel, we could, uh, gauge the way it's put together and say, yeah, we can, we can adapt, install that and support it ongoing. Yeah. I mean, even, even today we're supplying replacement parts to parks all over the country and world that right. didn't necessarily, uh, build with originally us. built with mm-hmm. us originally. So it's, it's possible. I think the step one would be to, Figure out who it, who built it first, what kind of conditions it in, you know, get us get us a set of eyes on it, and then what what new building is it going into? What challenges that might that produce? Mm-hmm. And then we would kind of work from there to figure out how it lays out and kind of figure out what their goals are in mind to quote a full team to come out and put it together, assemble it, 
uh, with a time frame that kind of meets their expectations on when they want to open. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so, cause we're going to need drawings and stuff like that. Right. That's um, right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that could throw a fork in it, but not something we can't overcome. We've overcome much greater hurdles. So we're, uh, we've got a pretty good squad. So it's, it's pretty amazing. The, yeah. uh, the math problems that are thrown our way and we got all our little folks working on it. Yep. So, um, so right now, as we speak, you're, you're out there selling the sixth generation of parks, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Describe what, yeah. what we're putting in parks these days. You know, if you came to me and said, look, I'm going into this market and I mm -hmm. have competitors, you know, that be the first step would be to kind of look and see what that current market is supporting. Um, it, it, to really build a sixth generation park means not just building a trampoline park. I think in our industry as a whole, I, I speak at some of the conferences, I think calling ourselves a trampoline park is kind of a taboo these days. Many of the existing brands have even taken a step further to call themselves action okay. parks or adventure parks. Course, yep. And that's crucial. And so when I think of a sixth gen park, I think of, I think of trampolines, you know, I think that's still one of the, if not the anchor attraction in these adventure parks, but just in this trip alone, I've seen clip and climb climbing walls, you know, having true blue belayed walls where kids can climb, they slowly drop to the, the ground. It's all fun. So all the walls are bright and colorful, um, really cool patterns and designs and, and are also fun and easy to do. There's not like your competition climbing, but funny that you Funny, I brought up competition climbing. <laughs> competition climbing, having like a molded kind of adventure park with that competition mm -hmm. climbing wall, which you're really familiar with because yeah. your daughter, I think, was a climber. Worked one. Yeah, 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 a climber. Yeah. So yeah. adding those features, I think, is important yeah. too. Yeah, the, the climbing features um, with our sister company, Entreprise, is is really solid. I mean, yeah, very well known company in the in the climbing world, whether it's fun climbing or sport climbing. You know, so imagine a space where you have those existing attractions you'd find in a trampoline park now and have these giant walls with route setting and you're bringing in a whole different demographic that you may not have appealed to um, before and then and then after that I'm seeing a lot of ninja courses ninja has been around for a really long time but it's more popular than ever yeah. tv show is is here to stay and uh, that's only growing in popularity with expanding in other countries yeah and um, variations on the ninja I mean yeah obstacles obstacle are, courses and, yeah. and parkour and, and yeah. all that are um are really popular yeah yeah um we've seen go-karts karting we've inside seen, um we've seen arcades really great arcades with great redemptions that would would rival what you'd see at chuck e. cheese or main event um i think that we we've heard it no fewer than three times that it's just free money yeah now, why why wouldn't you yeah know? yeah you know and, and they're making a lot from it yeah. so yeah redemption arcades we said it not done well yeah but there is, i think there's an example where it it really all depends on quantity, having the right quantity, where it's located the in the park, the mm -hmm. space, how it's configured. Um, so we know a lot of great companies that, that lease those out or you can buy them out, right? Yep. Uh, so something to consider there. Oh man. You've seen virtual reality. Vir oh yeah, virtual uh, reality. On is, almost and everybody. augmented reality, which uh, through, through Bala Motion, um, yep. augmented climbing, augmented jumping, um, our uh, interactive walls through Rugged Interactive, High Nine, Cardio Wall Duo. Um, got two great new attractions with um, Aerostrike and Head to Head yep. that we can add in. Anything with competition, um, right? Yeah, yeah. You gamification know? and competition are, are the key. And so the square footage of actual trampolines is shrinking while some of these other things. Um, and we're, we're developing strategic partnerships uh, to really help parks um, really almost turn key, right? Um, and so we're, we're, we're talking a lot about how do you help a, a, a new operator, whether they buy, use equipment and install, uh, there's a lot more that goes into a trampoline park than just the equipment that we provide. And so who better network than us to help provide, you know, point of sale recommendations, marketing recommendations, food and beverage recommendations. We have people that build our, our customers websites too. Yeah, so yeah. menu boards, the whole, even t-shirts or employee jerseys as well. So yeah. So yeah. Socks. Yeah. Been a partner for oh socks. Gosh, yeah. So, yeah. It's a, so we're, we're, we're very well resourced and that, that new, that, that gen five, gen six, you know, current park is, is, uh, you know, I think bringing in a Gen 1, Gen 2 park is going to be difficult. Um, and, and kind of the point of our talk today is how do you, how do you compete in 2021? Well, you, you upgrade to a Gen 6 park. Yeah. And, and so you need to take that into consideration. My, my 
our biggest conversations in the car ride this week has been, what do you think that capital investment might be from a Gen 1, Gen 2 park to a Gen 6 park? Yeah. You know, okay, don't factor in what you might spend on buying a used equipment and what you can reuse. But I mean, what are what do you think we're going to see in terms of capital spend to upgrade it? Um, I mean, it's in the, uh, you know, 150 is going to be in the floor, I think, $150,000. But I think, you know, to really get, uh, even if you're an existing Gen 1, Gen 2 park and, and you want to upgrade and stay in the same spot, I mean, um, you know, yeah, 150, go up to, up to $300,000, I think is what we're seeing is what it's going to take to, to get you competitive in 2021. Yeah, I, I've been Would preaching. Be? Yeah, I've been preaching a little bit, you know, how do you generate revenue? How do you add attractions that will generate new revenue? And I think when I think of generating new revenue, I think of appealing to a totally new demographic that you might not be reaching now, you know? And so I think of little kids, I think of a trampoline park core demographic, you were an operator. So I think when I say your core demographic is from, you know, maybe six, seven to 13, 14, would be your core, maybe a little bit. Yeah, you can drop a little on yeah, either side, but yeah. But what to do to bring in toddlers and and so soft play, yeah, soft play, soft play. Yeah, we, we we think we do think that creating an environment that allows the mom who has a two, three, four year old and also a 12, 13, 14 year old probably maybe caps out around fourteen for the, the general trampoline adventure park is is going to be ideal. And so you know we're putting in soft play in almost every design, and 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 our customers are loving that. So even if you've you you have an existing park, you're going to buy a park and operate it in the same location. Um, talking to us about adding soft play is um, is a really good conversation. Yeah, it doesn't have to be big. I mean, mm-hmm. we've we've done um, soft play centers that are a thousand square foot footprint yeah. that would have a capacity of you know thirty kids. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, doing the math, I mean, based on how much you might spend to install that, I mean, the ROI on on that could be less than a year. Yep. So um, I think that would be a key attraction. Um, sky's the limit bringing that one up since we went and visited them. He added to his original space an extra 10,000 square feet to add on a racing zip line, uh, a warped walls that has like a free fall stump jump on the back end of it. Um, what ended up probably being a 1500 square foot soft play and a bazooka ball arena, which is super unique to our industry and really forward thinking. Um, kind of like a mix between paintball and laser tag. Super cool. Yeah, it was, it was I loved it. Yeah. Yes. I, shot, I shot you a couple times. You did shoot but... me a couple times in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was really good. It's all good fun. Yeah, I I had a chance to visit that park while we were filming for what we'll be talking about next week. But um, yes, uh, tease, you know, a little little snippet. Uh, But uh, yeah, we uh, we had fun out there. That that uh, indoor playground is quite vast. It's it's pretty large, and um, we had some kids playing on it and whatnot, uh, so we could film and whatnot and they had a blast in there. So even though it's in that back corner, kids still sniffed it out and went straight to it. So it was amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So used parks. <laughs> so <laughs> used parks. Um, so I tell you what, in our closing statement here, why don't we uh, say our final thoughts on used versus new yeah. and, yeah. and just kind of uh, – you know, give you guys a break because you've been on the road so much and uh, we'll let our listeners um, be able to listen to this one a couple of times. So we'll have a, a little bit of a shorter episode, but they'll still be able to get all the information they need. Yeah. So my, my kind of final, final word would be um, ask questions before you buy, right? Let the buyer beware, caveat and tour and, and just ask questions. And we're happy to be available for those questions. Right. At the end of the day, we, we, we sell and manufacture and install, trampoline adventure park equipment. Um, but we, we, we're in this for a long-term relationship. So, you know, we're going to give you w- what we feel is the best advice and we'll, we'll, we'll jot it down. We'll give you um, pros and cons. We'll give you what, what we think the dollar figures would be um, to purchase a used park um, and move it versus um, creating some new, uh, brand new, brand new equipment. And, um, and we'll, we'll work with you to make the best decision possible. Yeah. I couldn't set it better myself. I mean, I've been in this business for six years and the relationship that I build built has been super important to me. And that's what I'm looking to do with this new 
kind of on guard entrepreneur who's going to come in and, and really spruce up a new park, whether that's in the existing space or in a new space. And so I don't want to miss the opportunity to make that connection with someone, whether it was a fun spot built park or, or somebody else's. And we, we build these relationships really on the back of just doing a lot of work that helps make them successful. Right. And that pre-work we don't get paid for, we don't ask to be paid for it. We want we believe our success is reliant on our customer success. So all that work we put in forward um, at, the, at the beginning of the sale really helps that, that piece of it. And so we want to be contacted. We want to be a part of it. We want to be a part of that relationship going forward. Um, we we want to see you be successful so you continue to grow this industry in a safe way. And uh, we'd love to be a part of it. So I think, I think there is absolutely a model where this absolutely works. Just like Scott said, you know, buyer beware, ask, ask too many questions. There are no dumb questions when it comes to this and get us involved as early as possible. Yeah. yeah you're putting your life savings on the line for some people and it's very, um, you know, noteworthy to ask all your questions. And like you said, there's no stupid questions, but at the end of the day, yes, it's always better to buy new from us because we do take painstaking measures to make sure everything's so safe. But even if you do go out and have to buy um, a used park, once fun spot gets a hold of it, it's still going to be a better park than it was. So at the end of the day, put the fun spot touch on it and uh, we'll make it a better park for you. If that's what you so choose to do. Um, I appreciate you bringing up, uh, bringing up the topic and giving us the opportunity to talk about it. I mean, I know we do these together, but um, it's, it's always a, a great time and, and um, you know, I hope people will continue to uh, download, listen, and um, I do want to give a, a real quick shout out. We, we took a phone call from um, Doug and Tina Goetzinger in Hiawatha, Iowa, uh, where we put in a soft play about a year and a half ago for them. They had, had a park that they bought that was built by somebody else, um, but, and I didn't know this, yeah. shame on me, but apparently the Midwest had a hurricane. Somehow. Oh, wow. And um, I, you know, I don't go, even remember I, the name. It's, of a, it's a different name. Yeah. It's not called a hurricane. But it, it, it destroyed and, and did a lot of damage across Iowa and, and some of these Midwestern states. And, mm. and so their, their park was, uh, had some damage. And so they were talking to us about, you know, maybe, maybe now with the one-two punch is a time to, to maybe make a few changes. And so I, I just want to say our hearts go out to our Midwestern uh, yeah. parks, adventure parks, and, and hope you guys are doing well. If there is anything we can do to, to help uh, make, uh, make the getting back open again, again, even better. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Give us a call. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Prayers and thoughts for sure. Well, guys, thank you so much. I know you must be tired. Grab a bite to eat, grab yourself some sleep, get back on the road, uh, <laughs> keep evangelizing a uh, fun spot across the nation. If you uh, want um, Matt or Scott to sign your puppy or anything like that, <laughs> they'll be on the road for some time. Uh, they're not selling t-shirts, but they might give you theirs off their back. They're that nice of a guy. So uh, anybody, let's all, um, let's all say, <laughs> let's all say farewell to everybody right now. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Tuesday town hall. Make sure you like subscribe. Uh, it only helps us get the word out even more to all your friends and be sure to share this with as many people as you can, because you don't want to miss these beautiful faces, right? So thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.